questions. We are going to give it a few more minutes as we let folks come in. All right, it looks like we can go ahead and get started. Hello again, my name is Kira Sobers and I'm the Media Digitization Manager at the Smithsonian Institution Archives, part of the Smithsonian Libraries and Archives, where we collect, preserve, and share the history of the Smithsonian Institution. On behalf of the archives, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's program and the sixth installment in the Smithsonian 175th Film Fest, Films from the Smithsonian Institution Archives. Before we get started, I wanna gratefully acknowledge the Piscataway people on whose ancestral homelands I live, as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here. I encourage everyone to learn more about the historic and current native communities in the area that you call home through your local museums and centers, as well as the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. And now for a few details about how this will all work. The chat box is where we'll be communicating with you throughout the program and where we'll post links as they come up in the discussion. If you're having technical problems, please send a private chat to either myself, Kira Sobers, or Emily Neckrish, my co-coordinator today, and we will try to help you out. If you have any questions throughout the program, we encourage you to put them in the Q&A box and we will answer them with our panelists towards the end. We hope that you will join us next month for the seventh installment in our film fest on February 25th from 12 to 1 p.m. We will be screening putting, I'm sorry, we will be screening clips from the Black Aviators video history collection. Um, and in these videos, we will be looking at um, interviews with Cornelius Coffey and Janet Harmon Bragg in particular, who are Black aviators prior, predating the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, and that will follow a conversation and presentation with Pam Henson and Hannah Byrne, the historians at the Smithsonian Institution Archives. For today's presentation, we will be screening a series of seven short videos in which the museum's paleontology staff discuss various parts of their work to restore, maintain, and understand the Triceratops mount displayed in the Dinosaur Hall. These films were created as part of the exhibit when the mount went up on display. Following the films, we'll sit down for a conversation with fossil preparator Steve Jabo, one of the stars of the series, preparator Michelle Pinsdorf, and fossil lab volunteer Peter Finkel. Steve Jabo started working at, in the Department of Paleobiology of the National Museum of Natural History in 1989 and has a position in the Vertebrate Paleontology Preparation Lab as a fossil preparator. In this position, Steve plans and conducts field expeditions to discover and collect vertebrate fossils. He then prepares them, meaning he extracts the fossils from the rock matrix and exposes their features to make them available to researchers for study. He conserves the fossils to ensure their long-term stability and utility and creates customs housings for their storage in the collections. He also creates molds and research quality casts of fossils and mounts them for exhibit. Michelle Pinsdorf is a fossil preparator working at the Smithsonian since 2012. She has helped to prepare specimens and create exhibits for the recently renovated deep time fossil halls, as well as other exhibits at the National Museum of Natural History. 
She also assists with volunteer training and visitor education and outreach. Michelle is currently working on preparing whale fossils collected in British Columbia, CT scanning specimens for research, and working on digital photographs of the deep time hall renovation. Peter Finkel has been volunteering with the fossil, fossil lab since 2009. He has worked on a variety of fossil preparation projects from leaf fossils to vertebrate specimens. He has also contributed to the archival storage effort, which will help protect and maintain thousands of fossil specimens for decades to come. Most recently, he helped prepare a whale specimen collected in British Columbia that dates back over 20 million years. Peter credits his attention to detail and hand-eye coordination, both important for fossil preparation, to his woodworking background. Enjoy these films. I'm Dr. Michael Brett Sermon, Museum Specialist for Dinosaurs at the Smithsonian. From 1889 to 1891, legendary collector John Bell Hatcher collected over 50 specimens of Triceratops from what is now Niobrara County in eastern Wyoming. All the specimens of Triceratops came from the Lance Formation, the last dinosaur-bearing formation of the Cretaceous period. He was collecting under the auspices of Othniel Charles Marsh of Yale University, who was at that time the first official vertebrate paleontologist of the U.S. government. Each specimen of Triceratops was packed in hay, crated up, and shipped by railroad to Yale University, where they were studied by Marsh. After Marsh died, all the specimens collected on government money were then repackaged and shipped by railroad down to the Smithsonian Institution. One of the first shipments contained our specimen of Triceratops. When Triceratops arrived at the Smithsonian, it was unpacked and prepared by Charles Gilmore, who later became our first curator of dinosaurs, and Norman Boss, the chief preparator. In 1905, our specimen of Triceratops became the first mounted horned dinosaur in the world. Two years after the mount was revealed, Hatcher, Marsh, and Lull's monograph on the Ceratopsian dinosaurs appeared as United States Geological Survey monograph number 49. This premier reference work is still used today by paleontologists researching Triceratops. Triceratops stood in this original posture in the Smithsonian's Arts and Industries Building and later in the Natural History Building for over 90 years. Hi, I'm Steve Jabo, and I'm a preparator in the Department of Paleobiology, and I'm one of the people who's working on the Triceratops mount. The old mount was a composite mount, meaning it was made up of several different skeletons. Each color in this drawing of the Triceratops skeleton represents a different individual of Triceratops that was used to make the original mount. The result was that many bones were mismatched. Two really obviously mismatched bones are the humeri, or the upper arm bones. You can see that the right humerus is much larger than the left humerus. The right humerus is the correct size, so we surface scanned it and created a mirror image to make a left humerus. We used a milling machine to give us a hard copy of the left humerus that we'll now use for our new mount. Some of the other bones were actually missing when they mounted the skeleton, and so preparators sculpted them as best they could. We think we can do a better job now using the computer. We used the same mirror imaging technique with data from a real bone to create a replacement, in this case a new left ilium or hip bone, from the original right ilium. One of the other things that we noticed about our skeleton is that the skull seemed like it was a little bit too small for the rest of the bones in the mount. This is fairly common. You hardly ever find a triceratops skull with the rest of the skeleton because of the way they're preserved. We took the scan data from the original skull and had it created 15% larger. Instead of a six-foot skull, we'll now have a seven-foot skull on our new mount. One of the other problems we had with our old mount is that when they mounted it, they didn't have real Triceratops rear feet, and so they used duckbill dinosaur rear feet. Back in the early 1990s, complete Triceratops feet were finally found. We can replace our old feet with casts of the real Triceratops feet.
Hi, I'm Ralph Chapman, and I'm a paleontologist here at the museum. And my name is Rolf Johnson, and I'm a paleontologist who works at the Milwaukee Public Museum. You know, when you try to reconstruct a dinosaur like Triceratops, it's no easy matter. First of all, Ralph, you know, the bones are pretty big and cumbersome. Uh, this is actually a cast replica, an exact replica, of the lower arm bone from a Torosaurus, a cousin to the Triceratops. Well, with the new technology that was employed here at the Smithsonian Institution, we've been able to make exact replicas of the same bones, but you can see they're much, much smaller. Well, why would you want small bones? Well, one reason is because it makes it a lot easier for us to actually play around with how those bones might fit together again. And that's one of the real challenges that we have when we try to build uh, or reconstruct a skeleton like an animal from uh, uh, the past, like a triceratops. It was in this very room that Rolf and I and a small group of paleontologists got together and we basically worked all the articulations of the miniature bones at every joint that was in the skeleton and we also used the fossilized footprints of ceratopsian dinosaurs and we rebuilt the skeleton of triceratops from the vertebral column out and the result was the posture you see in the mount and the animations that you see on the screen. You know I've been studying triceratops legs for years and this technology has really been an incredible uh, double blessing for us. Not only can we get that information that Ralph was talking about to uh, look at the shape and the size and the uh, form of these bones and also how they fit together, but as Ralph said, the animations of how this animal might have moved or walked are very, very important. Hi, I'm Steve Jabo. And I'm Pete Kraler. We're both preparators here at the Natural History Building. A conservator's assessment of our specimens in 1996 showed that years of heat, humidity, and vibration have seriously deteriorated the fossil bones. We began by conserving our triceratops, which was in the worst shape. After we removed the bones from the mount for conservation, we CT scanned some of them. We were able to verify pyrite disease, a condition caused by humidity in which growing pyrite crystals cause the bones to break apart. The bright spots on these CT scans show where the pyrite is growing inside of the bones. As we disassembled this skeleton, we painted each bone with a special hardener called polyvinyl butyrol. This penetrates the surface, hardens the interior, and prevents further crumbling. After the bones were conserved, we built custom-made padded plaster jackets for each of them. The jackets look like clamshells. A researcher can lift off one side of the clamshell, investigate that side of the bone, put it back on, turn the jacket over and lift off the other side to investigate. No direct handling of the bone is required. Here in the lab, we're making molds and casts from the original bones for the new mount. Jan is painting layers of latex on the bone to create the mold. We then make a rigid mother mold to support the latex mold. We make casts or exact replicas of the original bones by filling the mold with plaster, fiberglass cloth, and a dense foam to add strength and rigidity. The Triceratops skeleton on display is made of painted plaster casts, exact replicas that were molded from the original bones. Hi, my name is Art Anderson. And I'm Lisa Federici. We were brought in by the Smithsonian to help create the world's first digital dinosaur. There were several different three-dimensional scanners used in this project. Rebecca is demonstrating a laser scanner. Laser scanning is the process of collecting the physical geometry of an object and capturing that information in the computer. One second of laser collects 15,000 points of information. Then, because we don't need all these data points, we perform space sampling, in which we sample these data points every one millimeter. Then we use this scatter of points for polygonalization. Polygonalization is essentially a connect-the-dots process. We connect the dots, form little polygons, and then we have what's known as a solid model to work from. We can view this solid model from any angle and manipulate it in the computer 
just like we do with a physical model in our hands. If we want a physical model, we can use the same data to make that too. We can mill using directions from the computer that tell us how to carve the shape. And that's how the replacement left humerus was made. For certain elements that required a more accurate reproduction, we used a process called stereolithography, in which the computer directs a rapid prototyping machine to lay down layers of resin that are then hardened by a second laser. This is how we produce the 1 6 scale model of Triceratops and the 15% larger skull for the mount. Hi, my name is Art Anderson. And I'm Rebecca Snyder. I was one of the animators for the Triceratops project. My company was brought in to assist the Smithsonian in creating the world's first digital dinosaur. First, we recorded the position of the bones in the original mounted skeleton. Stickers were put on every bone, and a special digitizing tool was used to record those registration points in three-dimensional space. This gave us a cloud of points that represented the entire original mount. Then the skeleton was disassembled, and each bone was scanned in individually, picking up those little registration points. Each dot represents the position of a sticker. For example, here is the right humerus, or right upper arm bone, of Triceratops. Here it is, registered to that cloud of points showing the skeleton. Finally, we took all the bones that were scanned in and registered them to their place in the skeleton. This created a complete virtual skeleton in the computer. Once we had the original mount in the computer, we imported it into our animation software. There we were able to make changes to the posture based on the decisions of the paleontologists. This gave us the new posture for our Triceratops. Then I began to work on animating the Triceratops, reflecting the ideas scientists had about how Triceratops moved and could have walked. Hi, I'm Ralph Chapman, and I'm a paleontologist here at the Smithsonian. In this project, we have taken a 100-year-old skeleton that's based on fossils from a dinosaur that lived more than 65 million years ago that were collected by paleontologists in the 19th century, and we have applied 21st century technology toward reconstructing the skeleton and building it in the computer. The result is the mount you see in the hall and the virtual Triceratops, the first accurate digital dinosaur and the leading edge of dinosaur research today. Research is an ongoing process and the application of this new technology will allow us to develop and test new ideas about how dinosaurs and other extinct forms functioned as living animals. Models such as the virtual Triceratops will allow us to test many ideas about dinosaur biology, such as how fast they could run, how efficiently they could walk and move, and perhaps even questions about their metabolism. We might even be able to ask questions about their behavior, such as how Triceratops used its massive brow horns to fend off predators such as T-Rex, or even fight with other Triceratops. Further, artists interested in doing more accurate reconstructions of extinct animals can use these models as a basis for their work. The fleshed out reconstructions and animations we do will, short of going back in time, allow us to get as close as possible to seeing living dinosaurs on film. We are just at the starting point in developing questions we will be asking about dinosaurs and other extinct species using this approach. This is just the beginning, but the application of this new technology by researchers here at the Smithsonian and at many other institutions should allow us to generate some very exciting research over the next few years. Okay, now I am going to ask our panelists if they can turn their cameras on so we can have a little bit of discussion about that film. Thank you all. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. 
Can you each talk a little bit about your background and what you currently do at the Smithsonian? And Steve, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, I have a degree in um, basically paleontology, biogeology. It's a, in the geosciences it's from Penn State. <clears throat> and um, I've been at the museum, well, I guess, what did I say, 1989, my bio, um, over 30 years. And so right now uh, I'm working on the, the ubiquitous whale from British Columbia, uh, the skull of that one of those whales that were found. I'm slowly working the concretion off of that. But throughout my my work at the museum, I've been able to travel all over the world and collect, find and collect fossils of different things, mammals and, and mostly mammals and dinosaurs, uh, vertebrates that I work on. <clears throat> and um, uh, I don't know, that's about it. Uh, it's, it's a great place to work in. Uh, I really enjoy the lab. That's awesome. Thank you, Michelle. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I've been working at the Smithsonian for almost 10 years now. Uh, my background, I have a bachelor's in geology and a master's in vertebrate paleontology. And um, the Smithsonian is a spectacular place to work for a paleo paleontologist, paleobiologist, a geologist, any anybody in those related sciences. We have the the largest uh, collection of fossils of any museum in the world. Uh, so far, it's about forty two million numbered and cataloged specimens, and it requires a lot of work to sort of do the care and feeding of all of those fossils, including preparing them to make sure that. Um, what's available in our collection and what's coming into our collection from new uh, field work, things like that, uh, uh, has the most information uh, sort of exposed from those discoveries uh, available to researchers. Um, like Steve, right now I'm working on a fossil whale um, and um, every day the work is, is quite slow and tedious, but Every, every day brings about new exposures of that fossil coming out of the matrix or the host rock. So even though it's very slow, it's actually pretty exciting and motivating. Great. Peter? I started volunteering with the Smithsonian uh, at, the, at, the, at the Natural History Museum in 2009. I had been volunteering with the, uh, with the archives, with Kira and some of the other, those folks over there, but I had the opportunity to, to uh, to try my to try my hand somewhere else, um, I started out doing. Uh, originally, my my career was electrical engineering, but when I retired, I wanted to try something new. I'd always wanted to go on an archaeological dig, but I'd never liked camping, so I figured this was working at the fossil lab was giving me an opportunity to to work with some of the things that were found during a dig, without having to get my without having to sleep on a tent. So um, I, I've, I've, been, I've been doing this for a while now, and I guess we, this, this infamous um, British Columbia whale that both Steve and Michelle talked about, I started working on that when the hall closed in preparation for the, um, the, deep, the, the new deep time exhibit. And um, so I've been working on that whale for about five years now. And then as the... Um, as COVID hit and we were, weren't able to go back into the facility. So I, I haven't had been able to work on it for the past two years. That's why, that's one of the reasons that Steve and Michelle have been able to carry on some of that work. So it's, it's that, that is, that, that particular project has been a long-term, long-term effort by a lot of people. Thank you. Uh, that actually leads me to another question. So how long does it take on average to prepare a specimen like this infamous whale head that you've all been working on now? I mean, I'm sure it varies depending on the specimen and the size, but. It does, it's, it's more than just the skull. Uh, we all sort of have bits and pieces of, of two different individuals of, of that particular whale. And that's the result of a single um, field expedition um, of which many can happen over the course of a year, and uh, they can happen multiple years in a row at the same site or different sites. So there's always a pretty big influx of new material coming into the museum, uh, mostly for through spring to through fall is kind of our field season. And um, how long it takes to prepare a project really depends on, on the, the sort of the nature of the beast. Uh, a, a big full dinosaur skeleton will take a lot longer to prepare than maybe a small partially preserved mammal. Um, 
but it, it really depends. It depends on the, the creature or creatures, and it depends on the nature of the rock that they're preserved in, whether the rock is really soft and easy to work through, uh, or whether it's really, really hard and it takes a long time to just sort of slowly whittle it away. Uh, that's the case with the whale, for example. Um, we have documentation even back in the day when our, our uh, Diplodocus skeleton that's now prominently featured in, in the exhibits uh, at Natural History uh, was, was originally prepared and mounted. Uh, it took uh, about 10 person years to do that work uh, all combined. And uh, the person who was primarily responsible for that wrote down in his notebook that he would never <laughs> prepare and mount another sauropod <laughs> as a result of just how long that project ran. Thank you, that's fascinating. I mean, I think you you never really think of the amount of time some of these things take. You know, just, um... But also working in the fossil lab, I started working on leaf fossils, which are created by when a, when a leaf falls from, from the forest, you get layers of, of soil and sediment on top of it. So it's, it's a compression, it's a compression fossil. You can work on, those are very quick. I mean, you could, you could work on a leaf fossil in a matter of hours and be done with it. Um, Hillary, one of the other volunteers worked on a, a big palm fossil that's actually in the deep time hall. And, she, and that, was, that was also a compression fossil, but that took years to, to, to figure that one out too. So again, it depends, like Michelle says, it depends on the, uh, the size of the fossil and the material that it's in. Also, like Michelle said, the, uh, you, we can collect a lot more fossils than we can prepare them in the same amount of time. So we always have a backlog, um, which is why we, we rely on volunteers to help us um, get our work done because it, it's just, there's too much backlog for us to get it all done in a timely manner. Um, how has the Triceratops project impacted your work since it was completed? <sighs> um, hmm. The, as far as the, like the digital way that has, you know, opened lots of doors for different ways of, of replicating um, and, uh, you know, using the, the digital data for, for research um, is, I don't know, you know, it, for, as far as preparation goes, we didn't do a whole lot after that with Hatcher itself, but the techniques we used to build the mount, uh, we replicated over and over again for, for uh, subsequent dinosaur mounts. Um, so, I think, you know, that's probably the biggest way for my personal experience of how Hatcher affected my work. Are there any techniques that were developed for the project that have translated to other projects since then? Sure, like surface scanning um, is the main, main one. We first started with an optical light scanner. You saw Henry, we, he had this it looked like a big bank of lights and he would shoot it on there. Um, it was a different way of scanning, but now it's like laser scanning. It, it, you know, you have a thing that's about the size of an iron that you can flash around and just basically paint the surface of something much more quickly than you could um, back in the day when we did Hatcher. You can catch a lot more detail that way. You can, you, it's just the, the, the uh, technology has advanced so quickly and so much more better um, than it was before, as far as printing out those two, well, you know, tabletop sized printers that um, it's much less expensive than, uh, than we did back then. Uh, someone from the audience asked if there are any techniques that make contemporary pros say, oh, we don't do that anymore. Anything you notice in the film that is very like taboo today? <laughs> No, nothing taboo. We've advanced, like I was saying, this, the scanning. Uh, we don't use latex much anymore for making our molds. Um, we, uh, because Hatcher was so big, you know, Triceratops is a big animal, we were going to use lots and lots of molding rubber. And latex is much less expensive than silicone. So we use a lot of latex on the big bones, um, like the femurs and the, in, and the hip bones and things. Uh, but we used almost exclusively silicone now. Um, but there's nothing that was like, oh no, we would never do that again. 
Um, it was only 20 years ago. Maybe, maybe 10 more, 20 more years will be saying that. The technology will have advanced beyond whatever we were doing. <laughs> it was new. Right. But also, but also in part of when we were, um, and not just 20 years ago, when we, when we were working in the fossil lab to help take apart some of the old exhibits from the old hall, and we saw how some of the armatures were mounted through the bones and your holes were drilled into the bones to mount things. One of the, I know one of the things that we that were done with the new deep time was the armatures now are now more cradling the bones than really, they're doing less destruction to the bone and to the, the casts in order to display them. So that's one, I think that's one of the things that's changed a lot. Yeah, definitely. They used to use bones just as building materials, you know, drill them and screw them and attach them to things, not realizing they're, they were an organic substance that reacts to heat and humidity and stress and strain differently than, than building materials would. So, yeah, the hatcher had some of that for sure. And that plays into another question that came in from the audience, which you've kind of addressed a little bit already. Um, but have there been improvements in how a specimen is for display is fastened and held together? And are there improvements over the traditional steel bars and brackets used? Other things like the sort of cradling mounts? Yeah, I think Peter and Steve have, have given some good examples. I think that, that modern, um, modern methods for displaying specimens take into account the fact that they are materials unto themselves, uh, that, that as Steve was mentioning, that they do react with the environment. So it's, it's from, uh, it, it ranges from, from the brackets and the mounting structures themselves all the way up to the cases uh, and display structures that they're enclosed in when they're on exhibit. Um, that we're paying mind to making sure that we're using non-reactive and archival quality materials that won't interact chemically with the fossils themselves or break down themselves over time. Um, uh, and that includes things like having cases that are sealed to prevent uh, uh, humidity changes, temperature fluctuations, things like that. And we've got data loggers, monitors inside of those cases to help monitor conditions and make sure that we're not seeing big swings in temperature or humidity that could have effects on the fossils. Um, people think of, of fossil specimens as kind of just big rocks, uh, but but they do have that uh, uh, long-term over time interaction. Uh, the development of pyrite disease that was highlighted in the video is a pretty good example of that. Um, pyrite disease can kind of be, be latent in many fossil specimens. You have that mineral pyrite uh, pretty much in the fossils, a lot of the fossils already. It depends on what kind of deposit they, they come from, um, but those minerals are already present and it's, it's really comes down to the environment that they're kept in and exhibited in, uh, which can sort of trigger destabilization of those minerals or keep them fairly stable. So uh, we've learned a lot more about that sort of conservation science as time has gone on. And that new science is, is really reflected in the way that things are exhibited in the deep time exhibit. It's great to be able to go and see all the specimens. If you look up at the armatures, the armatures are like their own artworks. Um, and every individual bone is kind of cradled in the way that uh, a stone and a piece of jewelry would kind of be clasped in place. Those clasps can all be undone so that each individual bone from a mount can be lifted out for research or for conservation or repair if needed. That's a big improvement over old methodologies. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and since you brought up pirate disease, there was a question from the audience. How common is pirate disease among recovered fossils? And do the methods of um, preservation that were mentioned in the film, do those halt the pirate disease completely or just sort of slow it down? Uh, I, I'll take it. Um, the, the first part of that was, um, what was the first part of that question again? The, the... How common is it? Oh yeah. It's, it's fairly common. It's, it's a lot more common in shales, uh, in mud deposits and shales where like fish um, deposits that have a lot of, uh, so pyrite is an iron sulfide. And uh, when it's dispersed within the, the rock matrix, um, it's highly reactive to water vapor. It turns the, the sulfide into a sulfuric acid, which is, which slowly grows inside uh, salts and, and the acids grow and it blows the bone up from the inside out and the matrix and it's irreversible. All you can do is try to try to 
um, precipitate it out with an ammonium chloride bath and then control the environment. You can try to halt it in place and then control the environment that the fossil is in afterward um, by, like Michelle said, by the case, you know, keeping the humidity at a constant, you know, roughly 50% humidity would be good, uh, keeping the temperature um, constant too. Uh, so that in, in the stuff that we put on, like the, the hardener, the consolidant we put in, that doesn't really affect it, it creates sort of a vapor, but it could also, uh, or sort of a barrier to the vapor, but uh, the vapor can penetrate through that. It actually can almost hurt more because it'll trap things inside uh, the bone. So you'd have to look at them sort of individually of how to, how to treat each, each one, but the controlled environment is the best way to do it. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna completely change topics now a little bit here. Um, what is the most exciting slash unusual fossil you have recovered or uncovered? Okay, I'll go. I have, I have two of them. So back in 2002, we dug up a T-Rex. So that's that's an easy, you know, check mark digging up a T-Rex. Um, that was really fun, especially when we uncovered the foot. It was all sort of articulated in this big block. You know, all 19 bones of the foot and, and uh, all the foot bones in there. And uh, that was really fun to, to discover and then bring that back um, and then prep, the, prep it the rest of the way out. The other thing is um, we, we found an Allosaurus nesting site and we thought we were just finding eggshells, we thought. Um, and so we were sifting through the matrix and collecting eggshells. And then we found a tiny little vertebra, just maybe a couple millimeters long. We're like, oh, there's some other stuff in here. And so then we, we started taking a much closer look and one of our volunteers in the lab found um, a tiny, uh, maybe a millimeter long uh, and wide uh, tooth that was still inside the jaw that was like a, a almost embryonic or, or just freshly hatched. And so we realized, oh, there's, there's teeth in there. And then that just opened the floodgates and we were finding tons of mammal, um, different kinds of mammal teeth. This is a Jurassic site about 145 million years ago. And so we were finding lots of little mammals, other little um, reptiles, uh, other little dinos in there. <clears throat> and it, that was just the greatest thing that, I think that's the greatest project I've worked on is, is working on that nesting site. That's so cool. Michelle, what about you? It's actually a really tough question for me to answer, um, just because our collections are so varied. Um, I think that it's it's exciting to me whenever I get the opportunity to go out and do field collecting, go out on a field trip and, and have a hand in that part of the process, in the initial discovery of the fossil, bringing it back to the museum. And because we have a backlog of, of things to prepare from, from many, many years ago, uh, it's a real treat to be able to then uh, prepare yourself a specimen that you yourself collected. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing that with some of the materials that I've had the opportunity to help bring into the museum. But so far, uh, out of the projects that I've worked on, I think that um, things that the things that end up going on exhibit, um, it's, uh, it's, it kind of makes me proud to walk through the halls and see it's Oh, you know, even if I only just helped you know, paint something or move it into place after somebody else had had done the, the primary work of, of uh, assembling a fossil mount. Um, being a part of that effort uh, was was just a really exciting thing for me. So I've, I've been proud to work on that. That's awesome. How about you, Peter? Um, I haven't had the opportunity to do field work, so I can't say I've, like Steve, uncovered a, a, a T-Rex foot. <laughs> But uh, I, I always enjoy working on working on the next project. I, I mean, I enjoy working on the, the whale and finding we we found ear bones in the whale, and we were able to separate that out from the rest of the skull. And so it's just the it's just the everyday little discoveries, uh, getting a tooth out of the whale that then I was able to clean and really and and really show and have the the your curator take pints and look at that and have him get excited about that particular tooth. So every, I think every project that I've worked on is kind of new and different. That's awesome. Um, since Michelle and Stevie both mentioned going out to the field for fossils, uh, where are dinosaur fossils being found currently or where are you guys 
tending to get them from right now. That's the exciting part. They're everywhere. Uh, well, I shouldn't say they're everywhere. They're almost everywhere. Um, they weren't in my backyard when I was a little kid, desperately <laughs> hoping to find them. I'll tell you that much. But um, no, I mean, we, we um, were located, of course, in Washington, D.C., and there are Cretaceous age uh, dinosaur deposits not far from, uh, from Washington, D.C. So we don't have to go far from the city. Uh, we find uh, terrific um, Miocene uh, and, and earlier uh, marine deposits down uh, in Southern Maryland and Virginia. Um, there's some amazing cave deposits and ice age uh, deposits that are, that are also located around this area. And so um, the easiest way to find out whether or not there are fossils near you is to take a look at um, your United States Geological Survey or your state geological survey maps, which are freely available online. And um, once, uh, if you're able to come and visit the museum, there's a great exhibit actually by the by the restrooms <laughs> in the uh, in the deep time hall uh, called Dinosaurs in Your Backyard, where we've got a, a map of the United States and, and showing where uh, sort of the, the age of the bedrock and, and whether or not you might be able to find fossils uh, locally. Um, but we have a very broad swath of possibilities to do field work, even just within the United States, to say nothing of the rest of the continent and the rest of the world. And there's new discoveries being made all the time. Um, it's kind of dizzying, just the number of dinosaur species, new species that are being named every year. That's driven primarily by field work and new specimens coming in being known to science uh, through field work and preparation. Awesome. Um, so, Going back to how long something takes, <laughs> how long did the process of scanning the bones and building the virtual triceratops take? Was it weeks, months, years? Uh, the initial scanning uh, with the optical light scanner took a little bit longer um, just because it had never been done before. And so we were trying to still working out the process of it. Um, it took us, I think, just a couple of months to, we had, we set it all out, up, out in the hall. Uh, we had the scanner and everything out there. And Pete and I would take uh, a bone off the exhibit or off the mount and we'd put it in front of the scanner and then Henry would scan it. And then we would put it in a sandbox and start molding and cast, after we conserved it, start molding and casting it right away. And so we're kind of like leapfrogging on each other. We kept notes of everything that was scanned and everything that wasn't. Uh, had yet to be scanned. And so I think it took a couple of months to get the first set of scans in. And then there was some missing data where the, the light scan, like in the skull, you know, couldn't get this part, top part of the frill. We couldn't just take the skull off and, and put it in front of the scanner that's several hundred pounds and super fragile. And so we had to get, uh, we had to fill in some blanks with some laser scanning after the fact. And then there's a long process of um, decimating that data because you have millions of data points that at least back then computers couldn't really handle that much data. So you had to remove some of those data points without messing with the actual shape of the, the bone. So that takes a while to do that. And I think you saw in that video, Art Anderson, you connect the dots of all those remaining data points and you can surface those and then you make it watertight so that there's no holes or anything. So then you can have a complete uh, bone. I, it, so the whole project took us about two years to do, and that was like two years of full-time uh, work for uh, me and Pete and a couple of volunteers, Jen, and um, worked on it almost exclusively for, and Rebecca for two years, or, yeah, two years. I was wondering when he mentioned, you know, removing data points after doing the scans, like sort of why would you remove the data points? Well, that totally makes sense that the computers wouldn't necessarily be able to handle all of that data um, at that point. Yeah. And so, Each one of those points is a three, three dimensional axis. So you have, you know, it, it, there's a lot of data inside each one of those points and you have millions of those points over the surface. There, there are ways of doing it that you can, not mess with the morphology of the bone. You can't just like say, I'm gonna take every third point out because you don't know what that's doing. So you can you know, remove them from highly clustered places and plain flat places won't have as many. Yeah, that makes so much more sense now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what health and safety issues are present when doing preparation work? Are there toxic chemicals, et cetera? And what precautions do you use now compared to many years ago? 
there are some health and safety concerns. Um, we usually don't work with with really really dangerous chemicals, and that's 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 a plus. Um, but the the health and safety concerns involved sometimes aren't even chemical related at all. Um, we do a lot of work that produces fine dust. Um, a lot of our tools are. Um, sort of like fine scraping or chipping. They're usually powered by compressed air and having that air just sort of like flowing out around you uh, can take the dust that you're producing from, from uh, scribing away or, or scraping away or drilling away the rock matrix and put it into the air. So sort of our basic health and safety tools are things like safety glasses, uh, a good dust mask. We're very familiar with N95 dust masks. Uh, they're pretty comfortable for us because we wear them all the time uh, just for our normal work. And, um, you know, half mask face respirators and things like that. Um, uh, we, we wear those just so that we're not inhaling that dust. Um, and also to keep rock chips from flying into our eyes. We wear earmuffs to deaden the sound of a lot of the mechanical air powered tools that we use, things like that. Um, and uh, we've got some pretty good, uh, uh, like, you know, sturdy gloves, um, steel toed shoes, if we're moving around heavy fossils, and certainly a lot of things uh, associated with doing the doing field work, like really good sunscreen and giant water bottles so that we don't get dehydrated. Um, <laughs> But as far as lab processes go, we do work with some uh, with some chemicals. The the fumes that can be produced from some of the resins that we use for molding and casting, um, they're not they're not necessarily uh, 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 an inherent danger outright. But it's one of those things that if you stick around them for too long and you inhale too much of them over a period of time, it's just it's not good. So we use a lot of uh, uh, ventilation uh, and filtration. Um, uh, um, fixtures within our labs just to make sure that we're not uh, exposing ourselves to those chemicals as well as personal protective equipment like gloves and aprons and things like that to prevent us from coming into direct contact with those chemical substances. And um, that's, I mean, all of those things are a big improvement, even from, from when I first learned how to do preparation. It really depends on the outfit that you're in uh, as to um, uh, how strongly they prioritize health and safety, as to whether or not they provide uh, personal protective equipment um, or even educate uh, their, their students, volunteers and workers as to, you know, if you're doing this task, you need to wear X, Y and Z. Uh, so it's uh, uh, there's a great, I think, health and safety culture at the Smithsonian that uh, we've all been able to benefit from. That's also, uh, also. Uh each of the workstations you see people working in the fossil lab and also in the, in the, the paleo vertebrate prep lab all have air handlers so mm -hmm. that when you are scribing and you are cleaning all that dust you have a, a, a specific hood over you or, or a, basically a very hard large vacuum that's trying to suck some a lot of that a lot of that dust out of your face so it's it's not only the mask but it's also the air handler. We also have an acid lab um, and we do acid etching of carbonate rock. Um, and we just use uh, acetic acid. That's the only thing we really use right now for, for dissolving the carbonate rock. And we get it hundred um, percent glacial acetic acid. But so we have to um, thin that down to about a 5% maybe. And so you need this special equipment to handle that acid. You need special equipment to uh, like ventilation systems that can carry the acid fumes out of the building without, you know, destruct, destroying the vent system. And uh, so there's, there's a whole nother round of safety things you need to do for acid etching. Same thing, shields, gloves, aprons. We have a video in our, um, one of our video history collections of some acid etching being done and um, from the eighties and they are not using quite that extensive of protective yeah. gear. So I'm glad to hear that things have changed for the better in that area. Um, so that's one of those questions where like, we would look back and say, holy cow, we would not do that again. So they would dump, they'd get this carbonate rock. There would be like solidified, uh, say bryozoans in there or, or say clams. Um, but the, the original clam had dissolved out, the clam shell had dissolved out and got backfilled with the silica. And silica doesn't dissolve in uh, a hydrochloric acid or any sort of acid. And so they would take these blocks of limestone, put them in a bucket, throw in 100% hydrochloric acid and just let that thing boil away. And then you sift through and you get all the, the little things out when you're done. And you definitely would not do that again. We don't do it that way anymore. 
because, uh, you know. One of those techniques that changed for the better. <laughs> yeah, it would explode our oceans. Uh, which, which leads to another audience question of what techniques are now being used for cleaning of new, new specimens? And also, how do you spot and prepare a one millimeter tooth? Oh, carefully. <laughs> uh, Michelle, you want to talk about the prep part of it, and I'll talk about the tooth. Sure. Um, there's there's a there's a number of ways that you can approach preparation of a specimen, but I think your 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 two basic concerns that you kind of have to balance are how do you remove the most amount of rock possible from a fossil while still keeping the fossil properly supported. Uh, if you think of something like a, a modern dog skull or something like that, um, uh, it, it, it functions great when it's in a living animal. When that animal dies and you have this object that's now sitting and, and taking stresses from gravity in ways that it didn't when the animal was alive and that skull was, was encased in some nice you know flesh that was covering over it, um, uh, you're faced with some sort of, you know, a sort of physical challenges in, uh, in if you, you have a skull, you may want to leave uh, some, some rock around it as kind of a, a protective cradle because the, the rock that's in case that fossil has protected it for all the millions of years it has been in the ground. So it's a little bit of a choice um, that you make based on the condition of the fossil itself. Is it really broken and really fragile? Uh, does it have uh, a need to sort of have part of it remain embedded in the rock? And if that's the case, we can use uh, digital preparation methods like CT scanning to be able to see the part that can't be exposed for whatever reason. But for what can be exposed, um, our primary go-to tools are these air-powered tools called air scribes. And they, they kind of look like a, a big, like almost like a magic marker, kind of a, a thick pen or a pencil um, with a needle on the end uh, and a spring behind that needle that's powered by compressed air. So the compressed air pushes the needle forward and the spring helps rebound when that needle eventually snaps back. So it functions almost like a miniature jackhammer. And we'll use that to just very gently, very slowly chip, chip, chip away and create this sort of line of, of scratches. We're scratching away at the surface of the matrix to chip away very small fragments of rock and expose it. Once we get a little bit closer to the surface of the fossil, um, we'll switch to using uh, hand tools, uh, kind of like dental picks, actually. We'll, we'll pick up leftover dental picks from our dentists and repurpose, and sharpen those, those uh, sort of uh, needle tip and, and bladed surfaces uh, to get into shapes that we need to just very gently scrape the remainder of that matrix away from the surface of the fossil. Uh, depending on the nature of the matrix and the nature of the fossil, we can even use wooden tools. Um, that are very gentle um, and won't scratch the fossil. Because that's another part of the thing that we have to consider is if we just start drilling away um, and we don't really pay attention to where the fossil was located within that block of matrix, we may just as easily bust right through the fossil and scratch it uh, just as easily as we scratch the matrix. Um, those are the, those I think are the sort of the, the basic tools that we'll use most often in the lab to get that matrix away. And so to find that little tooth, uh, we have a system. Uh, we we uh, will put bulk matrix in the, uh, a series of sieves, and you put uh, the the sieves are what I use is a four millimeter wide sieve down to a two millimeter, down to a one millimeter, down to a 0.45 millimeter sieve at the end. Um, and then as we we dunk them in water, and as a, as the the matrix sort of dissolves around it it leaves the, the fossils um, in their various size grids. And so then you can take that grid, dry it under uh, a lamp or just let it dry out. And you, then you take that bit of matrix and you look at it under a microscope. And so we're finding these teeth between the one millimeter and the 0.45 millimeter sieves. And we'd find them in, the, in those two sieves, mainly those, the, the little teeth. And you, you put a, like a teaspoon of this stuff on a gridded, uh, block under the microscope and you slowly look at it. And then if you find something, you lick a, or you wet your, <laughs> your, your, your little brush and you, you touch it onto the, the tooth and it picks it up and then you put it in uh, a little box or, you know, container. And you just keep doing that until you find uh, everything that's in that little teaspoon, put that matrix aside, you don't throw it away, put that matrix aside, put another teaspoon in, look at it under the microscope, and then 
you know, pick out all the fossils out of that too. When you do that for every grid size, it's easier to find things when they're roughly the same size in the grids because uh, everything's about the same size and you don't get things hiding underneath other things. So it's the, 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 uh, the sieving is, is really important for that. And patients under the microscope. That's absolutely fascinating, especially, you know, I hadn't even thought about that aspect of like, okay, now you've found this thing and you've identified it, but like, how do you move it? You know, like you're saying, put it, wetting the tip of the brush and doing that. Like I hadn't even thought that about the fact that that would need to be a technique that would need to happen in order to actually like separate these specimens out. Um, we've got just a couple more minutes. So I'm going to pick one or two more wrap up questions. Um, one fun one, I think, is there a secret to telling real bone from sculpted slash painted bone within the exhibits? Oh, Michelle, you can speak to that in the exhibit part. Sure. Yeah, we we make it easy, um, and <laughs> or at least as easy as as possible. In that, um, this this is another example of where methods may have differed a little bit from from kind of back in the day to nowadays. Um, in back in the day, uh, exhibits were created as kind of showpiece elements, and um, it was it. I think it it behooved museums to say we have a complete whole skeleton rather than just kind of bits and pieces. But it's it's extremely rare to find any fossil that is even close to being complete. Um, or even with the bones articulated together as they would have been when the animal was alive. It's just a, a product of, of the preservation of fossils is that just like a modern skeleton, if you see roadkill on the side of the road, day one, it looks pretty fresh, but three months after that, it's gone. And that's because animals have eaten it, the bones have become scattered. That is the exact same way that fossils are preserved in the fossil record. And so um, mounts are usually constructed as what we call composites. You have multiple individuals of the same species whose bones are contributing to an individual mounted skeleton. And there's going to be some holes, uh, some, some bones that are not complete, uh, or some bones that are entirely missing from that composite mount. So at least at Natural History Museum, uh, the handy dandy way to tell the difference is to take a look at the skeleton itself. Nowadays, uh, it's, it's, it's considered um, best practices to leave um, either the cast parts are completely unpainted and they're, they're just white versus the bone, which is its natural fossil color, or when the cast part or reproduction are painted, they're painted in sort of a, a single monotone matte kind of color so that they stand out. They may not necessarily, you know, uh, uh, look jarringly different, but when you look up close, you can, you can see that the, the natural material has the modeled appearance, uh, difference in color and texture that you would expect to find from a, a nature generated object versus uh, the replicas, which are usually painted that monotone. Uh, they're also accompanied on the labels in the exhibits by these little sort of charts. So you can see an outline kind of uh, a drawing of the skeleton and it's charted out which parts are represented by actual fossil material and which parts are represented by cast replicas. Uh, so that makes it easy. Uh, and if you're ever in doubt, just ask, uh, because um, not all displays, not all museums do things quite the same way. So it never hurts to ask just to be sure. Great. Uh, okay, last question. The whale that you all are working on, uh, will it eventually be on display at the Natural History Museum? Is that sort of the, the eventual goal for these specimens that you all are uncovering? I don't think that's the, 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 uh, the final goal. The final goal is to get it prepped out uh, and for research. And then if, so the, the, the specimen actually will go back to Canada after it's all prepped, we'll get scans and, and casts of whatever we prep out. But the real specimen will go back to Canada British Columbia. And then uh, we can maybe, you know, if there's a reason to have this to show, so it's in this transition period of when whales are going from toothed whales to baleen whales. So if it, it tells a part of that story and it, and it fits in with an exhibit, then that may go on into that exhibit. But the, the goal of prepping it is for research, the ultimate goal. 
there are some museums that are exhibiting casts of this material right now, I think, or they plan to be in the near future. Those are museums up in Canada. So the advantage of us taking uh, the digital data and making physical molds and casts of these specimens as we're working on them is that it allows us in the future or presently, uh, not just our museum, but any other museum that we partner with uh, to be able to exhibit those materials or use them in sort of like touch-based uh, educational uh, opportunities, if not a permanent exhibit. Uh, so we've got our options open and those options are only gonna continue to get broader as we continue doing the work of preparing the fossils. Uh, we're not quite at that point yet at Natural History where we can make that decision just because we've still got so much work left to do. Great, thank you all so much for joining us today. You were, this was truly exciting and interesting and fascinating and all of that stuff to me. Um, and I appreciate you all agreeing to be part of this. Um, there's been a lot of great questions coming in through the, through the chat as well. So thank you again. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Thank you very much. Thanks.